Highways in cities stink, literally and figuratively. They decimate property values, increase childhood asthma rates, and are lined with litter and garbage. Who wants to live near this? Yes, I am aware that highways serve a vital economic role in cities. Since federal, state, and local governments work to undermine trains, buses, and streetcar systems over the past 100 years, highways are your best bet for getting around cities. What are you going to do? Walk across this? Or take a bus and get caught in the same traffic as everyone else? So some cities are experimenting with moving or eliminating their freeways in an attempt to open up land for development and improve the quality of life in their city. But it's a tough gamble because cars are important. How else are you going to be able to get around? In this video, I'm going to talk about a freeway removal project happening right now and give my two cents on it. So stick around, don't go anywhere. My name is Angelo and this is Architecture with Angelo. Massachusetts, a mixed bag of multimillionaire vacation hubs, the best colleges in the world, and post-industrial wastelands. This is how Massachusetts works. And this is basically the gist for New England at large. If you're upper middle class or rich, it's great. You have access to some of the best schools, good high paying jobs, great food, natural beauty, and so on. Especially if you live in, I don't know, for example, a bougie condo in the Seaport District or a Victorian mansion in Newton, Mass. If you're lower middle class or poor, it's another story entirely. Lots of Massachusetts cities have not recovered since the Great Depression and deindustrialization of the 1970s and 1980s and are today husks of their formal selves. Working class people used to have access to decent, unionized, and secure manufacturing jobs. Those jobs have largely disappeared in Massachusetts. Ask any Massachusetts resident, the first things that come to mind when you think of cities like Pittsfield, Springfield, Lowell, New Bedford, etc. They'll say crime, poverty, and corruption. These cities are littered with abandoned factories and provide little opportunity for residents. 100 years ago, however, these cities were filled with life. Now let's zoom into one of these struggling cities, Fall River. Fall River, like other small to mid-sized Massachusetts cities built around industry, was a magnet for jobs and a better way of life for immigrants. Immigrants came from all over, but the most notable wave of immigrants came from Portugal. The city was full of life and opportunity. As textile production moved south and the Great Depression set in, however, opportunity diminished. Then, highways disconnected the city from its waterfront and cut its downtown in half, making the city even less appealing and shrinking the city's population further. Today, Fall River is known for having one of the highest crime rates in the state and having inferior public services. Despite efforts made at reviving the city, nothing really seems to stick. The issues plaguing Fall River are the same issues plaguing post-industrial cities throughout the United States. At this point, it's almost like the city has nothing to lose. Back in 2014, the Massachusetts DOT carried out a planning study of a vital artery of the city that connects Northern Fall River to its downtown, the Route 79 Davel Street Corridor. They wanted to figure out how to retain the importance of this road, but reintroduce access to the Taunton Riverfront. Before Route 79 was constructed, people would take advantage of the waterfront, whether it be owning property, working in the waterfront, or just admiring the natural beauty of the river. The highway stripped residents of that ability, giving them sparsely used parks that are difficult to access. So by removing the ugly polluting ice or that blocks access to the river, the city can become more livable. That's the logic. So the project will take place in five stages. The first one is demolishing the existing roadways. The second is saying, where am I gonna put all these cars? So let me just construct a temporary roadway. The third stage is constructing the new Route 79, which is branded as an urban boulevard. Step four is demolishing the temporary roadway. And step five is gonna be jazzing it up with sidewalks, landscaping, bike lanes, and all that. So they're underway with this project. They closed Route 79 in late February. The end goal of this project is to make pedestrians and cyclists feel comfortable going to the Fall River waterfront, reconnecting the city with its waterfront and boosting property values in the process. City officials think this will give the city the boost it needs to attract visitors and new residents. At the same time, the South Coast Rail project is well underway. The $159 million Fall River leg of this project provides 90 minute service from Fall River to South Station in Boston. This will provide an alternate mode of transportation to Boston in hopes of attracting new residents and growing the city. Massachusetts has pretty good public transit by American standards, which really says a lot about how putrid public transit is in the United States. The fact that Fall River, a city with almost 100,000 people, does not have train access to Boston is just flat out pathetic. It's good that they're completing this project and it's good that it will create some jobs. 
And the fact that Fall River is starting to be more inclusive for people who don't have a car is a positive thing. This rail project and highway removal project should be watched closely by other New England cities. It'll be interesting to see what will happen to this waterfront after it's reconnected to the city. What's my prediction? I think it will be great for the city itself, giving them more money for public services. They can market the green space and waterfront apartments to Boston area commuters who don't want to pay to live closer to Boston. They'll get their photogenic golden hour photos of millennials and Zoomers enjoying kombucha or whatever under an amalgamation of string lights for their marketing campaign. But for the ordinary residents, in reality, it won't do much at all. Why is this the case? Well, there's a few reasons. First of all, the whole urban boulevard concept isn't really far off from a highway. The cars are still there. The drivers still have a highway hypnosis since it's basically an off-ramp and pedestrians and cyclists will still feel inferior to drivers. Yes, it is better than a highway, but it's kind of an appeasement to drivers, a kind of compromise. Here's the kicker. If you look at a map of Fall River, you notice that there is another highway. Hmm, curious. So the DOT could have used this as an opportunity to densify the area more, not keeping this artificial barrier in place. Why couldn't they just have the cars use the other highway instead? If the DOT did this, it would certainly make more sense. See, there's this phenomenon called brace paradox. Basically, it says that if you add roads, it can slow down the flow of traffic rather than speed it up. You can also think of it as induced demand where if you add more lanes to a road, it'll end up attracting more cars to the road and end up creating more traffic in the long run. That does seem counterintuitive and there are people that do dispute it, but in many circumstances, cities have removed freeways entirely and did not see any kind of spike in traffic congestion. For example, in Seoul, a freeway was removed and replaced with an urban park, no new traffic, or in New York when they pedestrianized much of Times Square. Again, no abnormal increase in traffic. So if these cities with millions of people can pull it off, I think Fall River can do so as well. So in my opinion, they should have done that instead. Okay, now that we got the urban planning stuff out of the way, how about the socioeconomics of things? Let's look at some metrics. First off, according to the US Census, only 15.7% of Fall River residents hold a bachelor's degree or higher. Compare that to 45.2% for Massachusetts. Of course, you don't need college to be successful per se, but odds are the population isn't filled with skilled contractors, welders, and professional athletes. Okay, I'm just putting it bluntly. Median household income is 49,613, which is half of Massachusetts as a whole. The average household income for Massachusetts is $89,026. How about the poverty rate? Well, in Fall River, it's 19%. One in five residents basically live in poverty. Compare that to Massachusetts as a whole, which is just 10.4%. So something is systemically and deeply wrong with this city. That's what the numbers say. So the city says, let's just take this highway out and put market rate housing along the waterfront and ta-da! Yeah, that's not gonna solve the city's problems. But hey, it'll make part of the city look nicer and it will bring more people into the city. But I think that this project will make Fall River fall victim to a kind of downtown trap or the nucleus of the city, its historic center, look all shiny and pretty, but everything else won't really change. I live about 10 minutes from Providence, the capital of Rhode Island. Fall River is around a half hour from me. Like Fall River, Providence is a post-industrial city. It was also sliced up by urban freeways. Its quality of life is better than Fall River's as it is buoyed by the affluent tax base of the east side and also has more economic opportunity but it saw the second greatest population decline after the Second World War in the United States, with Detroit being number one, of course. Since the 1990s, downtown Providence has undergone an intense beautification effort that happened in two waves. The first wave involved opening up the Wunaskertucket River, creating a canal. The canal is a positive asset for downtown, and the accompanying park gives it some green space. That's great! Next, Interstate 95 was relocated away from downtown and moved to the periphery. Investors have gobbled up the open parcels of land previously occupied by the highway and are building mixed-use buildings that cater to both drivers and bikers and walkers, which is fantastic. So now the downtown looks much better than it did in the 1980s, but the rest of Providence did not see such dramatic change. It mostly just stayed the same, with some parts continuing a slow decline. City officials may have thrown a bike lane here and some speed bumps there, but that's pretty much it. So how does this connect to Fall River? Well, here's my prediction. Downtown Fall River will look nice, but it's not really going to benefit locals much. 
and they provide them a place where they can hang out and some good new restaurants. But let's not forget the three most important words in real estate, location, location, and you guessed it, location. With the highway gone and prime real estate along the water being constructed at market rates, odds are it's not going to be that affordable for the average Fall River resident. Yes, they are allocating a certain percentage to affordable housing, but let's face it, that's not enough in this day and age. Fall River residents will be competing with Boston Yuppie commuters for housing near water, and housing near water tends to, guess what, be more expensive. So unless the city actually starts addressing systemic problems in the next policies to make its neighborhood safer, increase funding for schools, bring solid blue collar jobs to the city, etc. This will, to put it bluntly, just be putting lipstick on a pig. Now, I'm not disparaging the city of Fall River. It has a rich history and is a hub for Massachusetts Portuguese community, but the residents deserve to live in a better city. Hopefully this project will inspire the city to get its act together. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, that's all I've got today. So thanks for watching.